The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Good morning, everybody. A happy Monday to you all. Welcome back to another week of Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. I am your host, Dan Bespris, at Dan Bespris on Twitter, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. As I've said before, if you can spell it, you can find me. Uh, Or, if you don't feel like dealing with that nonsense, just Google Dan from HoopBall. You can find me there. Again, I do a lot related to fantasy sports on social media, so I really would appreciate you guys hunting me down because there are many things to be discussed outside the realm of me lecturing on a podcast for uh, 40 to 60 minutes this time of year. It's a fun, it's a particularly fun time of year because we are beginning today to talk to other people. I know. Blow your damn cap off, as I said it. I'm fully aware of it. We'll be talking to Eric Ong in just a couple of minutes on today's episode, breaking down the mock draft from last Tuesday. That was December the 1st. It was an industry mock draft. We did it on uh, on video, the picks were very fast, 45, 50 second clock, so we're sort of humming along. But a nice opportunity for everybody in that draft to break down what they did, why they did it, some of the other stuff going on kind of around their picks. And it's particularly important because as we continue to get more information now, we're, we're in the thick of draft season all of a sudden. So Yahoo, they updated their rankings over the weekend, which is super annoying considering we just did a little ADP to Yahoo projection analysis on our Friday show, and then they changed their projections. But it does give us something else to talk about in that I think it creates, frankly, a couple of our most interesting shows coming up, probably towards the end of this week, if I had to guess, where we can do a slightly more uh, significant iteration of what we did on Friday, which is look at those ADPs, see where they're moving, and now with Yahoo adjusting their projections... We have a really good idea of what direction guys are going to be going with their ADP numbers as well. Uh, again, you can follow HoopBall. Hoop-ball.com is the website. At HoopBall Fantasy on Twitter. That's where you can find them. Again, I am, I am at Dan Bespers. And the reason I... Uh, the reason that, that I, I frame it like that, why it's so important to get you guys connected to me on social media, is that there are reasons to talk to me on social media. Reason number one, we are recruiting here at HoopBall, and a number of you have reached out already. We're looking for blurb writers on the fantasy side. It's the it's the, it's the the first rung of the ladder, turning news into fantasy nuggets, digestible bite-sized pieces for the masses. It's how you learn how to write for fantasy. Hit me up if you're interested in that. My DMs are open, by the way, against all good advice. My DMs are open. We're looking for DFS people, you DFSers out there. I know there are a few of you. Hit me up if you're good at this stuff, especially if you do other sports. Uh, that's a reason to bug me. We're looking for team coverage, sales people. That's a spot where you could actually make a little bit of money on the sales side with us. Uh, gambling folk, if you guys are handicappers, maybe you've been doing it on your own and, and are interested in, in doing it in a more public-facing manner. All of these reasons to hit me up on Twitter at Dan Bespers, and also hoopball leagues are officially full, but the wonderful Andre has been building wait lists out, and actually, as of this morning, a wait list hit 12 people for a particular format, so we opened up another dang league, and that's what we'll do. I mean, if the wait lists keep filling up and we keep getting 12 people that are interested in the same type of format, we'll just open up a new one of that format Right now, the drafts are actually going on a lot of those hoop ball leagues, the, the first giant batch of them. Uh, any, any ones that open here in the next couple of days will set the draft for probably two days in the future. And instead of being an ultra slow draft, it'll just be a pretty dang slow draft, meaning right now the, uh, the slow drafts are four hours a pick, giving everybody a chance with people all over the globe. As we get closer to opening day, if we have to open any more leagues, we'll probably make it like uh, two to three hours per pick and just make sure that these slow drafts finish up before the season starts. But again, these are all good reasons. Hit me up on Twitter. Get in a hoop ball league, head-to-head cash, head-to-head free, roto cash, roto free, whatever you got. Get on a wait list right now. Come join us on the recruiting side. Hit me up. It's great. Look forward to talking to all of you guys. 
Welcome to the show. Those of you listening for the first time, uh, I hope you guys are, are going to enjoy the rest of today's podcast. Talking to Eric is a blast. I'll tell you right now, I did the interview with him already, and he has a, a brilliant COVID season related nugget towards the end of the podcast as well. So uh, make sure to stick around for that one. And uh, I think what we'll what we'll do here on the rest of today's show, and talk to Eric first, so you guys don't need to wait on that. I think that's why most of you guys are are excited about this episode. And after we're done talking to Eric, we'll do a quick spin around one of the two remaining divisions that we haven't covered yet in our kind of post-free agency, post-trade season look around the NBA. So, so that's the schedule for today's podcast. Let's jump right on in. I want to call this guest season on Fantasy NBA Today because I record hits with all of my favorite people in the fantasy landscape I don't know exactly when they're going to air on the podcast. They get interspersed over the two and change weeks leading up to opening night of the NBA. Uh, but very happy. This is this is an old bud. This is a hoop baller who I desperately... How many years... By the way, this is Eric Ong, and I'm going to say hello to you in a second. But I'm going to start by saying, how many years have you been yelling at me that I need to learn how to do auction leagues? And how many years have I completely ignored you now? <laughs> oh, first... <laughs> Oh, that what an introduction. Well, yeah. Hi, Dan. Hi, Eric. Um, I, I guess that I'd, I'd say around anywhere between two to three years now. Yeah, ever I know. Ever since I, I met you, ever since I started guesting and started talking about auction drafting mechanics with you, um, I've been telling you, try it. It's fun. It's it's fair. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and yet, here I sit still not and you're not alone by the way everyone should know uh brandon is yelling at me to do it brewski is yelling at me to do it uh now i've been yelled at by jared johnson over at roto world he wants me to do it eventually i'll probably buckle but i knew this wasn't going to be the year the 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 pandemic season was not going to be the one where i was learning a, a brand new trade uh eric by the way for those unfamiliar you can follow on twitter at fantasy hoopla the word fantasy and then h double o p L A, you are how many hours ahead of me are you? You're you're 16 hours ahead of me. Am I getting that right? It's something like that. I looked it up yesterday. Now I'm trying to remember what it was. I'm gonna just say it is. I don't. I'm not gonna tell people what day we're recording because I don't know when this is airing. But it's 5 p.m. for me right now. What time is it for you right now? It's 9 a.m. where I'm at in okay. my part of the world, Dan. So that is 16. You're 16 hours ahead of me. That's. That's wild. Eric's in the yep. Philippines. Um, where are you in the Philippines? Are you in Manila? Yes, I am. All right. Well, that's good because that's pretty much the only city most Americans know in the Philippines. So that works out pretty that works out pretty well for us over here. Uh, Eric is a legend. If you guys don't know Eric, know Eric. Again, at Fantasy Hoopla on Twitter. He's been in the fantasy game for what? Are, are you at like, are you over two decades now? No, no. I, I started playing in uh, 2003. Close. I we're close. In 2007. Yeah. So almost, we're almost through two full decades. Uh, you are. Yeah, my age is showing. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. This is an old man podcast now, and I, I everybody knows I lean into that. Uh, Eric is uh, officially the title or assistant editor. Is that the official title at Hoopball? Yeah, pretty much. I'm. Uh, I, I'm. I'm over here at Hoopball. Managing blurbs, making sure everything on on the site um, is up to date, and everything on our Twitter feed uh, that comes out, all that breaking yeah. news, all those, um, you know, everything that has to do with the NBA and fantasy. I, I'm I'm in charge for X amount of time here on Hoopball. That is critical, critical stuff. The backbone of any fantasy website, the the news feed. That's what gets that information from the world into the fantasy bite-sized nuggets going out there. But what I'm doing with all of the guests as we lead up to the season, uh, or you know, certainly anyone that was part of our Tuesday, December the 1st video mock draft, which honestly, there were like any number of 25 ways that thing could have exploded in my face, and it actually went relatively well. But we're breaking down the results of that. Eric had the fourth pick in a nine-category roto mock draft and we're just going to go through them one by one i'm gonna get your thoughts on your guys if if there was something that happened maybe right in front or right behind you that impacted your pick what do you thought about kind of who you ended up with and you know it's 
we only went 10 rounds deep. We didn't go the normal 13, 14, 15, because I find in mock drafts, people pretty much tune out after the 10th round. You just get people kind of going through the motions. A lot of people leave because they got stuff to do. So uh, we can move along in a good clip. We got key guys to talk about. Let's start at the top, Eric. You had fourth pick. You got Dame at four, which... You know, my, some people might say that's actually a little earlier than they expected him to go. Um, what's your take on on ending up with Dame at four? And maybe the question should be passing over guys that have been going in front of him, like, say, uh, Steph Curry or even a Luka Doncic. I've seen him go in nine category ahead of Dame, which not necessarily, I'm not saying I agree with that, but, uh, I mean, obviously a really safe and effective guy to get at the top, but your thoughts on pick number one for you? All right. Uh, let's start with the obvious, Luka Doncic. And um, first of all, for, for for everyone listening, we were drafting for a nine category roto league. So <laughs> I, I, see um, what you, I see what you're doing there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm laying down the predicate here. Yeah. Uh, and, and basically, the drawback that Luka has and it's his poor free throw shooting. Um, it's not something that I wanted to take on this early in the draft. I know he's expected to do fabulous great amazing things this season and i'm on board with that but from a rotisserie perspective i don't think i should take him ahead of somebody let's say like lillard now going on to the other guy you mentioned uh, steph curry um it's been a while since he's played and played at the top three or top five fantasy level so i'm going with the guy who's hot the guy who's hungrier, the guy who's currently playing at his prime, and between the two guards who are arguably interchangeable as far as um, fantasy value is concerned, I, I decided to go with Dame in this case. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with you. Like, I, I'd love to play devil's advocate here and say, ah, you should have done this, you should have done that. There's nothing wrong with Dame. Um, you know, I, I think Portland's actually a team that. I'm excited about their team this year. I feel like there's a, a breath of fresh air with Rob Covington in town, Derek Jones Jr., who's not a, a massive difference maker, but they just sort of got pieces, things, new faces, new friends and faces out there. I think they're going to play with a nice purpose this season. And uh, and you know if Dame can play, he will, which is critical in a short season as well. Looping back around, and I think we'll probably have more things to talk about with the rest of your guys because, you know, Dame is Dame. Your second round pick coming back uh, fourth from the end of that first round, which makes it pick 21. John Collins, uh, it feels like he slipped in this draft. I, I haven't. Have you been seeing the same thing as me in most of the mocks I've looked at, most of the ADPs I've looked at? He's been going closer to 14, 15, 16 range, and he fell to you at 21. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, I, 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 I have to concur with you in, in the league's, the real leagues that I've already drafted that decided to draft offline. Um, he's been going a lot earlier. So I'm pretty happy that um, he landed to me at 21st because, I mean, if you think about it, he, he's, he's one of the few big men um, that you can really count on as far as shooting good, uh, shooting well from the free throw line, you know, giving you, arguably 2010 and, and some blocks and even some threes. So he's, he's a, a very well-rounded center who's not named Anthony Davis or Carl Anthony Towns. So <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy, right? So I think he, he, it was good that he landed on my lap. Do you have the rest of the results from the draft in front of you? Because I don't want to ask you a, a question that's going to make you try to find something on the fly here. But there are a couple of names that went before Collins in this draft that I thought were kind of interesting. Do you have those names in front of you? Um, no, I don't. So okay, so I'll, you, I'll give you a few of them. Away. Yeah, so I'll, right. I'll set the stage for you and for the folks listening. Uh, at pick 21 in the second round, obviously that means that there were, um, I guess it'd be what, seven seven picks? before Eight picks before you in the second round? Um, Joel Embiid, Bam Adebayo, Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, Kyrie Irving, and Paul George. I, I can do the math, I promise. So eight picks before you in the second round. This was one of the first times I've ever I've seen Embiid, uh, Shea, go before John Collins. At least in terms of like where he might have ended up, I don't think I've seen Collins go later than 19 in almost any draft that I've looked at. Is that Does that parallel what you've seen so far? 
actually I haven't seen him go, you know, later than 14 yeah. in any of my mock or real drafts for that matter. It's crazy. Um, I think it's because a lot of my, you know, drafts happened before free agency and that's before the Hawks loaded up. And I think that there is this, I think it's possible. I don't know if it's um, exactly what we can pin the reason on that there is this belief that Collins is going to suffer from, you know, Atlanta being too crowded with all that talent that they accumulated over free agency. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. You might you might start to see him fall just a couple of spaces. I don't know if it'll be significant, but you know the difference between 15 and 21 is actually pretty big in the early parts of drafts. Your third round pick, uh, coming back the other way, would be pick 28. And uh, you got Nick Vucevic, which is... I mean, I don't know. That, like, people have heard me talk on this podcast for now two and a half years, so I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying I think Vooch is one of the safest top 25 type of guys in the NBA, and he's been getting drafted near 30. Uh, you got him generally where he's been going, and he strikes me as arguably the safest third-round pick in the NBA. I have nothing additional to say other than did you make this pick just to hear me compliment you? <laughs> no, I made the pick because I thought it was a good pick. Yeah. But, um, I, okay, again, rotisserie. Uh, big men who shoot free throws well are a prime commodity as far as I'm concerned. And that's part of the strategy that I employ every time I'm you know, drafting for Roto. I, I, I specifically seek out big men who shoot you know, free throw as well, because I don't want to lose that category. And the moment that my, and, and pairing him with Collins, both of them shoot free throws in the 80s, which is, is, is you know, way up there in the top, top you know, 5% or even less of, of big men in the league. So that's, that, that's prime real estate as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and I'm, I was just looking through the teams. I would say five out of the 12 teams have already drafted someone who will anchor their free throw percentage down so just simply by not drafting one of those guys you've already kind of guaranteed yourself at least six points in the free throw percentage department and where you go from here you know there's a lot of things that could still change that and other teams same story but you're like you've almost guaranteed middle of the pack at very worst in a category that folks know and i think you agree with me uh people don't pay attention to the percentages and in roto I think those are the easiest places to make hay because everyone is going to get, I don't want to say suckered because some of these guys are interesting fantasy players, but everyone's going to get sort of seduced by the guy who has the big counting numbers and kills you in one of the percentage categories. If you dodge those guys, you can you can walk to like 20 roto points between the two percentage categories. So I love it. I have, again, this is an easy one. Uh, so we'll just roll along from there, and we'll probably have more discussions on on further guys. I thought Collins was a really interesting one. Vooch is just, I mean, that's too damn easy. That was that's your that's your layup pick, I think, of this roto draft. Can I, can I call that? I've been using the term "gimme" on this podcast a lot, which, which is a golf uh, uh, note, I suppose. But Vooch, he's a tap in. He's a tap in, right? Yeah, he is. He's, he's a tap in. Um, literally a no brainer as far as I was concerned. I don't think I was seriously entertaining anyone else uh, uh, in that range. I think, like you said, he's safe. Yeah, I'm looking. So, I'm looking at the guys yeah. around him. Like, who went after Vooch that would have even entered the discussion? Maybe Chris Paul. Maybe Pascal Siakam. That might be the only two names I would have considered there. Which are fair options considering Roto, because you know both 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 of those guys are solid all around well-rounded players as well. Um, and at that time, Pascal Siakam did not have center eligibility yet. Right. And if he did, I might actually have considered him. I think he does have center eligibility now in Yahoo. Um, so, But at the time, given the, the information I had, he was only PF eligible. So kind of, you know, yeah, this I'll is blame a you. center league. I, wanted to, I just wanted to fill, fill those slots and not worry about them later. Yeah, I don't blame you. I mean, I'm just looking for things that were like even in the in the realm of possibility, yeah. and that's kind of it. 
Uh, your fourth round pick, Demonis Sabonis at 45. You were playing it relatively safe here in the early going. I um, I don't. I mean, I don't know how much higher he goes than this in a in a good or bad year, and and I also don't know how much lower he goes than this. You have a lot of guys, uh, Dame. I, I mean, Collins. I guess there's a little bit of a floor ceiling thing going on. Dame Vooch and Sabonis. You can basically just etch them into stone with what they're going to do this year. Yes, I think that's fair. Um, yeah. Sabonis was a strategic call at this point. Uh, I wanted to, because as I see my, my team forming, I try to visualize where I'm, where my team is ending up as far as the rotisserie um, standings are concerned. And I know I'm doing well in field goal thanks to my two big men. I know I'm doing solid in free throw because Lillard has good volume and my big men don't hurt me. And both of them roughly, you know, grab 10 rebounds apiece. And scoring is also good. So I wanted to dominate rebounds. I don't think between those three big men, Collins, Vooch, and Sabonis, I, I'm at that point of the, at, at the fourth round, I'm pretty much leading the league in, in rebounding right there. So uh, I can focus on other things after that. And that was kind of the thought process. And he also starts helping me in assists because at this point, a lot of the, there was an early guard run, obviously. And, and, and that's, and that's something that happens in almost all drafts, right? Guards tend to go point guards, especially tend to go early. So I got a big man who, who passes well. So it helps Lillard a bit and, you know, ups my assists per game. Uh, statistic yeah you're winning rebounds i know there's i think the only team even remotely close to you would be a uh, bruise team team billy hoyle he had cat deandre Aiden, and then ended up with tobias harris in the fourth round and donovan mitchell was his one guard in there so that kind of uh mitchell sort of matches with lillard cat Aiden, and then harris you have the the edge with the third center or the uh the kind of collins versus harris thing so he's the only one even remotely close to you at this point that's absolutely accurate. Are you at all concerned about the Sabonis plantar fasciitis, or is that uh, a, a, an afterthought for you at this point? No, actually, uh, coming into this draft, I was well aware that he is over that issue, and I believe I read something somewhere that he was even asking permission to play for the Lithuanian national team, et cetera, oh. et cetera. Um, obviously, I don't think it... it, it it happened, but he was well enough to have been able to ask for permission. So I think it's already going to be a non-issue coming into camp, and it's going to be a non-issue in the preseason. I'm actually I'm mad at Brew for taking my guy Tobias Harris uh, in the fourth round. He's he's just I think he was tro- I think he was trolling me at that point. I wasn't even I wasn't even in the draft for for him to try to troll me. That dude's been going in the in the 60s in almost every other draft, uh, but nine cat roto and all that. Um, fifth round, De'Aaron Fox. This is a bet on Alvin Gentry and the Kings. Um, the, the, uh, this is actually, I think he might be your worst free throw shooter at this point, your point guard. Um, but I, I, am guessing based on the pick that you're looking for kind of a monster surge of a year in a faster Kings offense and just less of a log jam in their backcourt with Bogdan gone and, uh, you know, obviously helping for or or hoping for good health for him this season as well. What am I missing on De'Aaron Fox in terms of the the optimism on your end? Uh, well, I will, the reason I was, I'm actually, you know, I, I prefer actually to take Fox a bit later than, than 50. Uh, I, I got him at 52, but um, his free throw shooting ain't good for a, for a point guard. But like I said, since I already invested in quality big men um, and Fox's volume ain't that high, I think Lillard more than enough compensates for his deficiency there. Um, I needed steals. I needed, you know, again, more support in points because at this point, rebounds were secure. So I'm, I'm just basically filling, you know, evening out the, the categories that I wanted to, to improve on. And he was the last best point guard available within that tier of value so i wanted a okay um i'll take his less than ideal free throw but i get my guard i get some steals and my assists suddenly jump up and i'm climbing back in the rankings over there 
You've also built a surprisingly strong field goal percent team without any one guy that you'd call a dominant field goal percent guy. You have uh, Dame, who's been slowly getting better, but obviously still a bit of a net negative. John Collins, a positive. Vooch, a slight positive. Sabonis, a positive. Darren Fox, actually very, very good in at field goal percent from the guard position. In fact, as he was finally getting healthy last year, his last 15 games, he shot over 50% from the field while scoring about 25 points a night, and he was number 53 in the league over that stretch. So you actually ended up getting him right where he was playing when the season shut down last year. And I, I, I think people that listen to this show would expect me to poo-poo a De'Aaron Fox pick here, uh, but I'm not as down on him as I have been uh, the last year, really last year. I guess the year before would have been rookie season, so I don't even pay attention. Uh, well, am I getting that right? It might be. I, the time flies. Regardless, uh, I'm not as down on this pick not as so I have bad, been in the past. Right? Not so bad. Right, exactly. Um, like you, I think I probably would have been hoping to get him a hair later, but he probably wasn't getting back to you because you had, what, some 16-odd picks between this one and your next one? So, yeah, I get it. Um for me, I'm you know, I, I always play this game looking back at a draft and, and look at some of the guys going shortly thereafter. The the next few picks off the board were Lamarcus Aldridge, Mitchell Robinson, Miles Turner, DeMar DeRozan, Andre Drummond, CJ McCollum. I don't know that you can just I don't know that you can argue any one of those guys is definitely a better pick than De'Aaron Fox. I, in fact, you know, I, I think the only one on that list where you can look at it and go, all right, well, there's Maybe a tiny bit more upside would be what if Andre Drummond decides to go back to Pistons Drummond. But overall, in terms of kind of the excitement factor and the very high floor, Fox is actually pretty good this year. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to kill you for that one. I think people might might have expected me to, but I'm not going to. And the next one, I can lavish you with additional praise because it's TJ Warren, another one of the another Dan Vespers old man type. Uh, Warren at 69, coming off one of the best bubble performances in the NBA. He was brilliant before the playoffs in particular. Over his last 15 games, if you include some of the playoff performances, I don't know why you would, but you can. He was uh, number 11 in the entire NBA. Now, we're, he's not going to be that good this coming year, but really, what's going to stand in his way from doing exactly what he did last year, which was better than where you got him? This one feels like another gimme. So I'm, I'm I'm pretty happy about taking Warren at this spot. I think I actually got him at where I see his floor uh, being this season. Top 70 is a safe floor for Warren, Agreed. and he can only get better than that. I in in uh, if he if he continues the momentum that he had uh, in the Orlando bubble, he could be flirting easily with top 50, maybe even top 35 value. Uh, of course, you know. There, there, there will be some changes because during that time, uh, Sabonis wasn't playing and, and this and that. But overall, I think it's, like you said, safe. And here is another guy who shoots from the field very well, shoots from the line also very well. Yeah. Again, Roto, I, like you, I like drafting with percentages. And yeah. I'm pretty proud that my team is solid across the board so far at this point. Yeah, you just don't take a guy that's going to ruin one of the two percentages. It's it's wild. I think a lot of folks, and you know, one of the things that I, I hope to do with this podcast or have been doing, maybe I should say I hope to have been doing, over the last couple of years is simplifying the game. And I think, Eric, you've done a wonderful job of that with your team to this point. You don't have to go get a specialist in free throw percent or field goal. Now, Dame does sort of fall into that category, but he's so good at everything that you can't really call him that. You don't have to get the guy that is, you know, the best at field goal percent or the best at free throw percent. All you really have to do is avoid the guys that are terrible at it. And like I said before, you can kind of walk into anywhere from about 16 to 24 roto points in those two categories by just not shooting yourself in the foot. And Warren is a positive. He's a net positive in both of those categories. It's part of why his value has such a high floor. Uh, when you're good at two categories that people aren't paying attention to, uh, a lot of people look at the numbers and you're like, how did that? I don't understand how he got here. That's it. Um, the next guy on your team, I legitimately don't know anything about because 
He's not an old man. He's the opposite. You took a rookie. You took a rookie, Eric. I was with you all the way through your top six picks, but it's seven. I'm off. I'm out of Team Eric anymore. <laughs> you got you got James Weissman of uh, the Warriors, the number two overall pick in the draft this year. Feel free to tell me who he is. What is his fantasy game even like? I have mentioned his name nary a time on this podcast to this point. All right. So... My name is Eric, and I have a crush on, on James <laughs> Weissman. Um, and um, I, I guess it's it's probably too early. And I'll be the first to admit it's too it was too early for Weissman at seventy six. Uh, listeners, uh, you're hearing it from me. It, it was early. Uh, reasoning wise, um, if you look at my team, I have solid percentages, rebounding, scoring, assists are there. I'm lacking blocks. My, my Up to this point, my best shot blocker is John Collins, who, who might see a dip in that thanks to the, you know, playing alongside Clint Capella. So I needed a, a really solid shot blocker, somebody who has a chance, if given the minutes and the opportunity, um, can, you know, block more than one and a half shots per game. And at the time, that was James Wiseman. Now, like you said, you don't know much about him so he's a seven foot one rookie with i think a seven foot six wingspan who who runs the floor like a you know like a forward but you know has solid hops and he's playing for the warriors um he envisions himself growing into somebody like a chris bosch he's somebody um who wants to expand his range and shoot the three eventually but he actually has the skill set to eventually play like David Robinson. So if you can picture a hybrid, I mean, we're obviously talking about future career and best case scenario potential here, but a Chris Bosch, David Robinson hybrid is effectively like a first round monster, right? But obviously he's a rookie and he's not going to do that just yet. But I, you know, I, when it comes to the point that the Warriors realize that we're not going to win this without Clay. We're not. We're not going to be the Lakers, even with Clay, probably. But the point is, let's develop Wiseman because he's going to be our player of the future, and I'm counting on that. All right. So let me push back on you a tiny bit on this one. Again, I don't know anything about Wiseman, but if you were hunting blocks, why not Wendell Carter Jr., who was still on the board and would conceivably be a tiny bit safer play? Well, okay. I'm going to push back here. I, I can't really count Wendell Carter as safe anymore. I, yeah, I suppose Believe so. me, I've been a huge fan of Wendell Carter Jr. since his rookie season. But the guy has been nothing but disappointing since, you know, coming to the NBA. Yeah. Not by his fault entirely, because the poor guy has been dealing with various injuries, whether it's uh, a sprained thumb that's been uh, taking him out of you know, five or six games, or maybe, you know, this and that. So it's it's hampered his growth. So I'm, as much as I see Wendell Carter Jr. as, you know, a solid defender, et cetera, et cetera, his durability is, is something that concerns me. And I, I don't know if he's going to be solid enough to play uh, consistently. So I'm going to go with the younger guy with fresher legs and without a busted thumb. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, round eight coming. Uh, I guess we're coming back now in round eight. I've lost track of the exact number here. Weissman was seventy six. Sergi Baca at ninety three. Was this the the backup play in case Weissman doesn't get you the blocks you need? You figure Serge will get his twenty five to twenty eight. He gets the Montrez Harrell minutes for the Clippers, basically. We're on the same page. So in case my my. my... My Wiseman fandom fails me. I, I still have a backup plan. <laughs> Again, he's he's a guy who helps with the threes, helps with the blocks. And Serge Ibaka, you know, this late, we're talking about close to the hundreds here now at 93, is somebody who actually shoots reasonably, you know, well from the line. And again, he follows the criteria, my strict criteria, if you haven't noticed yet, about my, my people have to shoot very well both from the field and the line as much as possible and the counting cats will follow from there so yeah he's i think a pretty safe pick at this point 
Do you um, think? Do you think Serge? Sorry to jump in. Do you think his blocks come back a little bit this year? He was at just point eight last season, which seemed even for him. And when, I know he's been trending down in that department. Even for him, that seemed weirdly low. Yes, because uh, at the time, I think when he was playing with the Raptors, uh, what happened was he was staying farther away from the basket. He was shooting a lot more threes than he used to. So now that he's with the Clippers, I think they're going to count on him for some of that interior defense with, you know, nobody else being, uh, you know, to be counted on to to protect the, the rim. So... I'd be thrilled to see him do 1.1, 1.2, for yeah. that matter. I mean, a nice little bump from 0.8 is something that will help me across the board because Vucevic gives me 0.8 also, right? Something yeah. like that, or even one. He'll, he'll flirt with a block per game. So if I can get a little bit, you know, it's instead of focusing on counting cats and have one guy carrying me, I just want my big men to do, you know, a little bit and contribute across the board from there. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, your ninth-round pick, Andrew Wiggins, went back to Golden State. You're hoping that some of the stuff he was doing last year carries over. Um, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm not. I'm not a Wiggins believer this year. Sell me on him. Well, neither am I. And I actually commented <laughs> that that wasn't too. Oh, hard. that's if right. I, I forgot. Oh. I, well, I, we wait. We need to re. We need to relive this moment. I totally forgot. And I believe. You said something so eloquent as you made the as you made the pick in the draft room. What was that word you said? Yuck. Yuck. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> that, was, that was great, Eric. That might that might have been the moment of the draft, actually. Yes, yes, it it, it was for everyone and myself. So, um, pretty much because in a in a, in a draft, pretty much everybody's so proud of their picks, et cetera, et cetera. And here I go. Um, it it was a crying pick. I I, I wasn't too happy because. I don't think he'll uh, um, hit that same level as he did last season because uh, the Warriors are going to be playing differently now. He has, you know, Steph playing full time, and the addition of Kelly Oubre is going to going to affect him somewhat. He's going to have to slide down and play shooting guard. He was playing small forward for for the bulk of last season. So, um, in the end, he he locks my. I, I, at this point, if you look at all my guys, I think I'm averaging over 20-plus points per game across the board, probably with Sabonis and Ibaka being the only exceptions here. Um, he wins me points. He doesn't hurt me anywhere too much. And again, um, as long as Wiggins does not fall back to being a complete vanilla guy like he was earlier in his career, I think that that part of his growth as a player is something that's it is, is more permanent and regardless of his usage or uh, minutes you know other statistics that defensive mindset is something that's going to be stuck with him already and, and 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 to be fair to the warriors they are trying to to be a a team that defends as a team so he not all of his defensive efforts will pop on the sheet but, you know, some of it will, and I'm, I'm hoping to catch it. Your 10th round, your last pick in this draft, we only went 10 rounds deep, was uh, another tap-in, honestly. Duncan Robinson at, uh, what number, 117? Is that where we're at with this one? He'll beat that with his eyes closed this year. And, I don't know, I'm looking at your team, and I, I guess there probably is a little need for a three-point infusion. Well, you got it in your 10th round guy. He's... He is going in that range, and he's an easy one that you just plug in. You get good percentages out of a three-point shooter. That that also fits your mold for the team. So this one, I'm going to give a little golf clap here because, you know, you found a guy in the 10th round that you can just put on. You, you can just roll out there every game. You're not going to have to worry about it. A lot of, a lot of teams end up dropping their 10th round pick. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, getting Duncan Robinson, I I don't know why um, he he fell that far. I'm I'm happy he did. For for if if you look at the list of three point specialists out there, very few, only a handful really shoot as well as Duncan Robinson does from the field. And again, so since he doesn't hurt me there, 
um, he's going to load up and give me almost four, four threes a game, uh, you know, average of three point X, right? Um, he and Lillard are going to be the anchors of the three point shooting. Um, you know, even my big men like Serge Ibaka, Vucevic, they chip in a little bit of threes here and there. Yeah. It's probably even Collins has, you know, one three per game. Uh, it, that's just the whole concept that, you know, um, it was the one stat that I probably that I felt I, I was weakest at, and it would simply round out my team without hurting me anywhere. So I, I know I said I was only going to ask you about your team, but I want to ask one more broad stroke question because this is such a weird year. 72 games, COVID season spiking in the United States right now. It's an it's an absolute mess out here. And, and you know, I don't know how many of these guys have had it already. We know at least some of the names pre-bubble. I'm guessing quite a few have had it since then. You know, is there anything you're doing differently this year with the shorter season and just all the factors? For me, at least, it's... I'm actually being even more cautious, more safe with my draft, trying to maximize games played. I want durable guys this year because everyone's going to miss some games. You just can't afford to have a guy who's going to miss games on top of the weird. What about you? Are you changing anything for this season or are you kind of just closing your eyes and hoping for the best on some of that stuff? Mm, Little of both. I, I am. I, I am tweaking. I, I am focusing my strategies. Okay. So this was a roto draft. So, my strategy was build a balanced team, et cetera, et cetera. So in head-to-head, -head especially, which is the format that gets nailed by uh, absences due to injury and possibly COVID the most, uh, my strategy is going to be more, you know, closer to Roto. If you if you think about it, I'm going to be focusing heavily on the shooting percentages because um, those two categories, if I can win those every week, um, those aren't games play dependent. And whether or not my guy played um, three games instead of the four that he could have, um, as long as he shot at the volume he does and at the accurate accuracy rate that I'm expecting, I should be happy. Um, but given the situation that, you know, COVID is a risk, aside from the regular injuries that NBA players go through, uh, I, I think that everyone is going to be in for a lot of missed games. So in that situation, it's good to stock up on the shooting percentages because um, it's not volume dependent. That's brilliant. That's well said. I love it. Uh, he is the great Eric Ong, the thriller from Manila. Thanks, my man. Well, let's do this again. I, I'm, I, I say that and then I always end up getting so bogged down with child care and other crap that I don't follow through on my side. But can we, can we get you back here at some point early in the season? Sure. Uh, it'll be my Hell pleasure. Yeah. I always enjoy guesting on your show and talking about fantasy. Um, it, it's been a blast. This was fun. Absolutely. And that was a really, really interesting and key thought at the end there. I'm, I promise I'll be highlighting that in, in the write-up on this podcast. At Fantasy Hoopla on Twitter. Find him. At Fantasy Hoopla. H-O-O-P-L-A. He is Eric Ong. Eric, we'll talk to you soon. The great Eric Ong, ladies and gentlemen. The great Eric Ong. I want to pause here before we hit our spin around the uh, Northwest Division. That's what's coming up on today's podcast. We decided to make my pick on the fly here. To remind you guys of our partnership with our buddies over at mybookie.ag. Mybookie.ag. You bet, you win, they pay. We have been fleecing them as an organization. Absolutely, positively fleecing bookies with our, our hoop ball gaming picks, the great Mike Larson, our NFL expert, went a perfect 3-0 and oh on yesterday's NFL card. Uh, you can get all of those picks with our Wager Pass or Hoop Ball 360 membership. Wager Pass is just $9.99 a month. That's crazy low. I actually worked in sports betting for a while, uh, about a decade ago. $9.99 doesn't usually get you even one pick from one handicapper on the internet, and that is all of our picks from all of our pros for a full month for $9.99. It's, it's nothing. It's bargain basement. It's, what, 33 cents a day, basically, uh, gets you all of this good stuff, and we've just been fleecing the books. Between our odds makers stuff, or the odds boost things, and uh, recent quality picks, there was a couple of, I mean, everybody has a down day every once in a while, but just overall, 
a lot of really cool reasons to get a wager pass or a HoopBall 360. Sign up at my bookie with promo code HoopBall. Please make sure you use the promo code HoopBall when you sign up. It is of critical importance to make sure they know who sent you mybookie.ag. Promo code HoopBall. You bet. You win. They pay. Why wait? I have a couple more things on the hoop ball side I want to tell you guys about, but let's dive into the Northwest Division here, and we'll do this relatively fast because uh, I, you know, the chat with Eric was some 35, 40 minutes long. I don't want to keep you guys here for you know an hour 15 on these podcasts. The Denver Nuggets is where we'll begin as, as we do a quick trip through. Right now, um, you know, Denver, their, their power forward position battle just became Paul Millsap versus Jamichael Green instead of Paul Millsap versus Jeremy Grant. And, uh, where last year Millsap ended up hurt for a stretch and Grant was able to jump in. I don't know that either one of these guys really dominates that position battle, although it's worth noting that Jamichael Green could end up playing some backup center minutes as well. He might be the backup power forward and the backup center on this team, depending on how the Nuggets want to use a guy like Bol Bol, or I think they picked up Isaiah Hartenstein from the Rockets. Uh... The only problem, of course, is, you know, how does that reflect on the rest of the minutes? My guess would be, if Jokic is playing some 32, 33 minutes a game during the regular season, call it like six to seven, maybe, of those backup center minutes might go to green, depending on how much they trust the other guys. I, I don't I don't know that they do. Well, it's it's a fear. It's a fear. I don't think that there's enough there to say you need to go out and get Jermichael Green. Uh, I don't think there's enough there to say you need to go out and get Paul Millsap, frankly, at this stage of his career. But it's something to keep an eye on. They may slide Michael Porter Jr. up to play some power forward, depending on you know whether or not they're going to go small for stretches. He, right now, is likely the sort of the bench gunner on this team, where Gary Harris has been a disappointment at shooting guard, but you kind of know what you're getting out of him. Jamal Murray... Not, no real question marks there. And then Jokic, of course, is your starter at center. Uh, Will Barton is the forgotten man on this team. Barton, who was uh, quite good for the entire regular season for this Nuggets team last year, uh, didn't play in the bubble, and has been sort of summarily dismissed. Uh, there's There's almost no expectations of him being good this year. And... Frankly, I'm surprised by it. He was quite solid for the Nuggets last year, and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it was this, actually the same exact story. He was a guy who was getting drafted in that 125 to 140 range. No one thought he was going to do anything, and then he just quietly went out there and put up a top 70 fantasy season when everybody was looking at other guys. I I don't know why his role would change all that much. That You know, the Michael Porter Jr. thing... He'll see some of those small forward minutes, but he's going to see minutes elsewhere. And they're just, this was a really deep team in Denver in previous years, and they've thinned the herd a little bit, where Monty Morris is your strict backup point guard. There isn't really a strict backup shooting guard on this team. Barton could slide down. Uh, Troy Daniels, I guess, could get in there. You know, where in the past there were Malik Beasley's and Torrey Craig's. And there were just guys that could soak up these extra minutes. There aren't any more. This is a team that on a given night, you're going to see Murray, Harris, Barton, Millsap, Jokic. Starting five. And then in terms of bench guys, you're probably looking mostly at Green, Porter Jr., and Monty Morris. This is an eight-deep team with smatterings of other stuff. You know, P.J. Dozier will play a handful of minutes. Uh, you'll see a backup center at some point out there. Um, so... You know, that that funnels minutes into the starters. So I think Will Barton could be an interesting value this year. Jokic, Murray, those guys are pretty predictable, probably dodging the power forward spot. And then with Gary Harris, does he ever get back to being something like what he used to be? He was number 152 in 30 minutes a game last year, 32 minutes a game. It's just, uh, I don't know what's happened. He's, he's not that guy anymore. And you can take him in the very last round and hope for the best because he's going to see minutes on this team. But he's just sort of... Not very good anymore from a fantasy perspective. Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, Cat, obviously, seeing the bulk of the minutes at center. D'Angelo Russell seeing the bulk of the minutes, likely at shooting guard. I would think Ricky Rubio sees the bulk of the minutes at point guard. If he comes off the bench behind Russell, Rubio will still play plenty of minutes. That would mean 
Malik Beasley is probably your starting shooting guard. And uh, the rookie, Anthony Edwards, is likely your starting small forward. In that instance, Minnesota has a host of power forwards. They, you know, it might be a lot of Wancho Hernan Gomez. They might be mixing and matching a little bit. I'll tell you what I'm doing with this team. Uh, D'Angelo Russell, I think, is going to have a really nice season. Cat, obviously, is going to have a nice season. You know, I, I know his heart is extremely heavy, which sucks that we have to even th- consider that from a fantasy standpoint because he's having one of the worst years of anybody on earth, really. Uh, apparently losing, I don't know if you guys heard this, seven family members to COVID this year, which, I mean, I can't even I, I can't even fathom, but I do think he'll have a pretty good fantasy season. It's a, that's a hard pivot to make on a podcast. Um... Malik Beasley, I'm I'm kind of tempted to leave alone. Uh, I know that he put up some really nice games towards the end of last year when everybody else was gone in Minnesota. He was taking 16 shots a game. He was scoring a ton. I don't know what the hell happened to his, his steals, but they just weren't there. He's not going to have quite that same role with Cat, D'Lo, and Rubio all out there, and the rookie, Edwards. So I, I'm probably going to pass on Malik Beasley. I don't... I don't see him as a guy that's about to turn some massive corner here. He's probably looking, you know, more like the 150 range. So he's a pass. You know I don't draft rookies, so Edwards is a pass. And so I think the only real question mark here, by the way, I'm not, Mancho Hernan Gomez I'm also not going in on. He's very much a very poor man's iteration of Larry Markkinen in terms of his fantasy game. So the only question I think is, what do we do with Ricky Rubio? And it'll be a step back from last year, uh, undoubtedly. He's not going to have the same leadership role on this Minnesota team that he had in Phoenix. But I also don't that it's quite as large of a drop as some folks would have you believe. And what I mean by that is there's a, there's a homecoming element here. Last year in Phoenix, he played 31 minutes a game, averaged 13 and 9 with 1.4 steals, uh... He did play in in some of the bubble games, and he played fewer minutes in those games that he was in there. So actually, pre-bubble, he was ever so slightly better than what it finished at the end of the year. Very good foul shooter, you know, very bad field goal percent guy. That's kind of always been the deal there. They're going to use him in Minnesota because they need stabilizing. And what he showed in Phoenix last year was that he was just that. He was a stabilizing force in the backcourt. He can go for steals. He can play some defense. You know, he's, he's a big point guard, so he can see the floor well. And he can set people up. He can set up Cat. He can set up D'Lo. Those guys don't have to do all the, the heavy lifting to get into the offense. So I, I think Rubio is actually going to play probably close to that 30-minute-a-game mark, either wh- whether he's a starter or a bench guy. You'll probably just see a, a, you know, a, a drop back in usage in some capacity here. You know, there's just... D'Lo and, and Cat are going to take more shots than Booker and DeAndre Ayton, I think is probably the best way to look at it, because everyone else is kind of fighting for the scraps behind superstars on, on basketball teams these days. So, I, you know, he's going to miss a game here and there. Minnesota's not very good, so they'll have no real impetus to overpress on Rubio. But I do think, you know, when you look at number 61 on a per-game basis last year, a you know, drop back probably only drops him maybe a round, round and a half, 80. 85, something in that neck of the woods. So I don't think it's going to be a disaster, but I do think that there's a slight step back, and he's probably getting drafted pretty close to where he should. Oklahoma City, if you can name half the players on this team, you win today's contest of I I don't know what I'm winning. Uh, Shea Gilgis-Alexander obviously is going to be the guy on the team this year. He will. There will be no cap to how much he's expected to do This season. Last year, Shea, if you include the bubble games, which actually uh, dragged him back a little bit, uh, he was around 35 minutes a game. Oh, actually, you know what? I think that includes the playoffs. So let's 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 take that out of the mix. In fact, let's go back and and let's make sure we're looking at pre bubble stuff. Um, He's easy to find on on rank boards because his name is longer than everybody else's. Shea was number 46 in pre bubble action. He was extremely durable, played 35 minutes a game, 19, 6 and 3. Uh, steal, almost a block, good percentages, not many three-pointers. That's uh, probably your thing that's holding him back right now. On 15 shots a game. You know, just think of it from this perspective. Oklahoma City lost Gallinari to free agency. And I know Gallo only took 14 shots, but also five free throws. So you can sort of push that into more of like a 
16 and a half shots kind of deal. Chris Paul was taking 13 shots and four free throws a game. Dennis Schroeder, who easy to forget when you think about guys that were on OKC last year that are are no longer there. Schroeder actually took 15 shots a game last season for the Thunder. And who came in? Nobody who demands any usage. They lost three usage guys and got zero usage guys coming back. Not to say that Shea is going to take, you know, 35 shots that those guys left behind. It's going to get spread around a little bit. But he's going to get probably 20 shots a game this year. This is just go do whatever the hell you want, Shea, kind of season, where Al Horford is going to be expected to try to keep everybody in line you know, aside from the games, he will almost undoubtedly be resting. Trevor Ariza is, by all accounts, sitting things out. So you look at the other spots on the floor on this team, and you're looking at guys like Lugans Dort, Hamadou Giallo, Darius Baisley, as guys that are, frankly, just going to have to do something. Truthfully, I don't even know who's going to play power forward for this Thunder team. They've got, like, five power forward eligible guys, and it's not clear which of them are actually going to get to do stuff. Uh, you know, do you, do you get, uh, does Kenny Hustle, they got him from the, the Pelicans in a trade. Justin Jackson, who I think came over from the Mavs in a trade. Does one of those guys slide up and play power forward? Uh, the preseason actually is going to tell us a little bit of stuff on the Thunder. This is one of those rare instances where the preseason can be somewhat useful. I think you can probably pencil in Shea, Dort, Baisley, and Horford in four of the starting spots. And frankly, I'd be willing to take a flyer on any of those weirdos because you just don't know. Like, there's there's so much to go around right now. First of all, Lugans Dort, you know, we saw that his defense is going to keep him on the floor. His fantasy game is not good. Uh, Darius Baisley does have a fantasy game, as we saw uh, really mostly late last year. I know Dort had that one giant playoff performance where he hit six three-pointers and scored 30 points. But, uh, you know, one note on him, despite the fact that he plays terrific defense, he doesn't actually get that many steals or blocks. Uh, We'll see if that adjusts here in year two. But his fantasy game is less exciting, I guess, if you were looking at some of these peripheral guys. Darius Baisley was closer, although he also wasn't seeing as many minutes. So it's hard to know how exactly that would translate. We don't have the the kind of numbers to say, okay, well, here's what would happen. He did play relatively large minutes kind of late in the bubble when the Thunder were resting some other guys. And he scored 22 points, 10 rebounds, had a steal and a block. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to take a chance late on one of the other Thunder, Baisley's probably the guy. I like Al Horford a lot. Uh, As we talked about later uh, on one of the shows late last week, he's going to rest a bunch. So certainly more so for Roto with a games cap. And then Shea, like, I, don't, I honestly don't know how high is too high at this point. He's seemingly, and we can, you know, we can go to the Yahoo ADPs to, to get a little more confirmation. His ADP right now is 34.6. He probably goes earlier than that in drafts. And honestly, you know, I don't know if I would take him in the second round because you, you wipe out a lot of the upside there. But I would, I know it's rare for me to, to go buzzy, but I think I would take I think I would take Shea in the third, and I'd be okay with it. A rare twist for me, but there's just no one there. Portland, Portland has a pretty easy team to handicap this year. Uh, Yusuf Nurkic is going to play huge center minutes, backed up by Ennis Cantor. Rob Covington is going to play big power forward minutes. Uh, Carmelo Anthony will likely, well, Zach Collins will get blended around here at power forward and center. Uh, Dame the point guard, CJ the shooting guard, and then. Portland's only real question is, it sounds like Derek Jones Jr. is going to start at small forward to begin the year. Um, With Rodney Hood, I don't think fully recovered yet. Once he is, he probably slides in to see a bunch of those small forward minutes. Really, all you need to know about this Portland team is that some of the guys we were looking at and thinking, could this guy take a step forward if the path gets cleared out? Well, the path didn't clear. So Gary Trent Jr., the path is, is murky. I would say Derek Jones Jr., frankly, the path is a little bit murky for consistent minutes because uh, the guys battling are Gary Trent, 
Derek Jones Jr. and Carmelo Anthony are all kind of fighting for the backup shooting guard, small forward, power forward minutes. And then you can throw Rodney Hood into that mix too, because once he's healthy, I don't know that he's just going to get 30 minutes a game. So there's a bit of a log jam there. Um, you know, Covington, he'll he'll play pretty much all he can handle. He he immediately becomes one of their better players. They traded for him. They obviously want him. Uh, Derek Jones Jr. is is going to have a tough time doing enough with those guys around him on this team. You know, he might be able to get a few rebounds, a steal, a block kind of stuff, but I, I don't think it's going to be enough. So do you... I think the only question with Portland, you know... That, where you draft some of their guys, I guess, is a question. But, you know, Nurk, Rocco, CJ, Dame, those guys are all getting drafted in the early to middle early rounds. The, the, the only question on Portland that strikes me is, do you draft any of those other names I mentioned? Do you draft Mello? Probably not. Do you draft Derek Jones Jr.? Probably not. Rodney Hood? Probably not. I think I'm leaving those guys to just... Like, is there a world where any one of them could have full season value? I, I doubt it intermittent spurts oh yeah i mean with hood probably i mean i haven't heard that he's ready to go i assume he's out uh you know there i mean there's a way where maybe here at the beginning of the season with one or maybe two guys down Derek jones jr could be the closest but uh, it's not you know you're not getting more than a, a what a couple of weeks if that it's all pass and finally the utah jazz boyan bogdanovich we'd heard is likely not ready to start the year which means you probably actually see a little bit more Derek Favors at the beginning of the season. They'll probably just go a little bigger, if I had to guess. Uh, Joe Ingles, Royce O'Neal are going to be duking it out for that small forward spot. Donovan Mitchell, Mike Conley, the obvious backcourt guys, and then Jordan Clarkson is the bench scoring option for Utah. Also a very easy team to handicap. I don't think you can draft Derek Favors as a backup center even if there is a little bit of a path at power forward until Bogdanovich comes back. I also don't think you could draft Bogdanovich because we don't know exactly how much time he's going to miss to start the year. He'll be very easy to plug and play after that, but you guys know how I feel about missed games at the front end. They have a way of piling up with other weirdo injuries, especially this year where you know we don't know how easy it is for these guys to train right now. I'm not drafting Royce O'Neal much as I liked what he was doing when some guys were out. I'm probably also leaving Joe Ingles alone. Uh, he, he struggled mightily when both Conley and Donovan Mitchell were healthy as the third orchestrator. That's a difficult position to be in. I'm surprised Mike Conley, honestly, is going where he is. I thought he would get drafted closer to 100. He's not falling as far as I wanted, and that's upsetting to me. Conley going near 81. I mean, he's probably a top 75 kind of guy this year, so there really isn't a whole lot of value left. Donovan Mitchell, super safe fourth rounder. He'll probably get drafted before that because he's durable and that's useful this year. Uh, and then, you know, Rudy Gobert, a guy I thought that would fall a little bit farther, but he's, you know, relatively safe third rounder this season. So a couple of pretty easy teams to handicap in that Northwest division. I think, uh, you know, Minnesota... And, and Oklahoma City are probably your slightly more complicated ones. And hopefully that information I passed along is of, uh, of some value to you. Quickly, before we wrap things up here, I want to remind you guys that the Brewski 150 is in the Fantasy Pass. The Fantasy Pass at HoopBall, the newest subscription method to hoop-ball.com. Just $4.99 a month gets you the updated today Brewski 150, the full draft guide, the DFS package, which begins when the preseason starts and will run year-round in all major sports, and all of our in-season tools. We'll have some new uh, mathematical, statistical tools for the first time this year called the Fantasy Appraiser. Uh, you have incredible access to the pros at HoopBall with daily Discord chats that will be taking place while the games are going on. You, of course, have all the various grids we've always had, schedule grids, depth charts, streaming charts, projections. All of that is included in the in-season stuff. All of that is included in the Fantasy Pass at just $4.99 a month. I told you earlier in the show about the Wager Pass at $9.99 a month. You want to roll those two bad boys together? It's not $15 bucks a month. It's $13. $12.99 a month for the Wager Pass and the Fantasy Pass together. That is the hoop ball. 360 plan please do go get something drop a five-star review on the podcast please i beg of you i'm on bended knee here 
in the corner of my bedroom slash office in this very weird 2020 season. Tomorrow, uh, we'll chat with another pro from the mock draft. We'll also break down the last of the six divisions that would be the Pacific. That's coming up on our Tuesday edition of Fantasy NBA Today. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this Monday show. Tried to talk fast as best I could. I am Dan Vespers at that on Twitter. Hit me up. Join the Hoop Ball League. Recruiting, all that good stuff. We'll talk on Twitter. So long, everybody. This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.